following program on Ada Verna 24 is classified for general audience. It is intended for all ages. It contains little or no violence, no strong language, and little or no sexual dialogue or situations. We would like to remind our viewers that the views expressed in this program by our participating guests are solely viewpoints of them who take part and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Verena Media Network. A very good evening and you are joining us on Gen XYZ where we talk about topics related to the youth and contemporary issues related to the youth. Now today we have a topic that I'm sure not a lot of us have thought separately specifically about but it is such a big part of our lives it's almost omnipotent whenever we go on our phone whenever we turn on the TV it's always there and that's journalism but specifically mobile journalism now I'm sure a lot of us have already seen you know when we scroll on Instagram we see news reports from meme channels and we see small short videos done by separate people separate influencers maybe content creators now what we may not have known when we were looking at those videos is it's part of a collective called mobile journalism or mojo for short and to speak about mojo we have someone that i feel like is the most suited individual to speak to us about this topic and that is mr glenn mulcahy who is the director of mojo fest limited thank you very much glenn for taking the time to speak to our audience and to really enlighten us on this issue on this topic actually because it is a very interesting topic not a lot is known specifically about the topic but everyone is aware of the existence of mobile journalism you know recording something on your phone but it definitely goes beyond that and that's what we're here to speak about today right. so um, I would like to ask you Glenn I have heard that even before Mojo was a thing you were involved in the inception of the proliferation of Mojo you're, you're a driving force even as we speak today that's what your current objective is so I feel like you'd be best suited uh, to answer this where we start off this discussion by asking you what exactly is mobile journalism what is Mojo I think mobile journalism can be kind of uh, broken down into two discrete different categories, okay? So the first one is the professional aspect of journalism, which uses mobile devices to basically tell stories across multimedia platforms. But then there's a separate genre, if you like, which is more user-generated gener content, more citizen reporting, which I think is the part that you basically have seen the explosion of. It will often will be the media that you will see for breaking news where citizens basically are basically inspired to take their devices out and capture what they're witnessing in real time. So, um, yeah, two different camps, and you're right. I mean, it's, it's not really a new thing. Uh, my journey of mobile journalism would go back to 2006, 2007. So 13, 14 years into it at this stage. So yeah, it's been around quite a while. Exactly. You've been part of the creation almost of Mojo. I read somewhere that even before the iPhone decided that video format is going to be furthered, uh, you were shooting on a Nokia. So right. you've had quite the experience. Now, I would like to ask you, since you've been part of mobile journalism since 2006, 2007, could you just let us know exactly the history of mobile journalism? How did it come to be over the years? I think... Um I'd love to say that it was a very clearly strategically planned out thing, but it wasn't. It was very much kind of just an organic gathering of people who, many of whom I think were already invested in what's known as video journalism. That's been around 25 years. Um, and they were using bigger broadcast cameras basically to, to create content for television, but not the full size ones. So cameras that cost maybe eight, 9,000 euros at the time. And a lot of those people, I think, realized that everyone wanted, at that stage, 2006, 2007, they wanted a good camera phone. It was the only the step into the evolution of smartphones and the touchscreen user interface that I think changed the entire landscape. Because we moved from, up until then, something that had two functions. It was a phone and a camera to something that had multiple functions. It could do audio, it could do video, it could do live streaming, the whole suite. And that's where the birth of mobile journalism really started. Exactly. So what started with just a small clip turned into editing, turned into sound production, all on this small device or maybe just on a separate laptop uh, if need be. Absolutely. So there's quite uh, the uh, proliferation in recent times as well. And we recently just uh, had uh, Mojo Lanka happen, That's Mojo right. Lanka Festival, where we celebrated mobile journalism and we 
had a very constructive discussion on where mobile journalism is heading in Sri Lanka as well. So we're here in Sri Lanka, mobile journalism has a festival. I'm sure across the globe it's much bigger because it's really just starting out uh, over here just over the past few years. Sure. So uh, I think now that we have a history of how it happened up to this point, could you tell us exactly how big is mobile journalism today? That is the multi-million dollar question. I get asked that question by brands and companies that are developing apps and software and hardware all the time. And honestly, I don't think anyone has ever conducted a poll to try and get a scope of it. So short answer, I genuinely have no idea. But what I will tell you is this, certainly since around 2011, 2012, I was being invited to travel to different countries to introduce newsrooms to mobile journalism. And I've worked with a huge amount of national and international broadcasters. If even 10% of all the people I've trained are doing it, then the numbers are definitely up in the tens of thousands, if not maybe half a million people, it could be anywhere between the two. And I think there's one other thing, which is, is that while we all collectively, I think, in the, in the industry agree to use the term mobile journalism, I think an awful lot of people are actually doing it without realizing that's what other people call it. So I've certainly experienced this in the States in particular, where people will just say, well, yeah, I'm a journalist. I just use a phone sometimes. They don't see it as a distinct thing from traditional journalism. They just see it all as part of the same one. And I think that's part of the way, uh, that's part of the reason it's hard to quantify how popular it really is. Exactly. It's not a homogenous uh, issue where there is, we, they're not categorizing it as a yeah. separate uh, form of journalism, but purely as part of journalism as a whole. Exactly. Um, but now I think you just mentioned, Glenn, that there are people that may not know that they're participating in mobile journalism mm -hmm. uh, but are actually doing the very same. So I think a lot of us here would like to really understand, can anyone be part of mobile journalism? Is that, for, is that inclusive of all? Th that is probably the single biggest selling point, the USP of mobile journalism, because unlike any other device, probably in the history of television news, we're at the first point where there are literally a billion devices out there, maybe two billion devices out there. So if you have a smartphone, irrespective of whether it's entry level, medium, or really expensive, the truth about it is if it has a camera and a reasonably good amount of storage, you absolutely can get started. And you know, I often get asked, oh, you, you can't do mobile journalism without loads of accessories, but that's not actually true at all anymore. I would say that, and I've messaged this a lot actually through the conference that recently, um, Really all you need is a microphone solution and you can get those for like anything from $10 up so they don't have to be super expensive. And all you're doing there is trying to improve the audio quality because as we're experiencing today, if you film in windy environments, exactly. that is a big challenge for a phone without a mic. So if you get a mic, you can basically introduce great audio quality as well. So it really is the democratization of media. It's a term we've heard spoken about a lot over the last decade, but I think smartphones truly are the ultimate leveler. Anyone, anyone who is interested can tap into free resources like those that Mojalanka have published and learn all the core skills for how to do great visual storytelling, which is ultimately the backbone of how you use your phone to communicate. Exactly, and Mojo Lanka has definitely had a very packed agenda recently as well with keynote speakers from across the globe and you're one of them and I'm sure there was quite the, uh, well, quite the insightful take uh, over the past few uh, days of having the conference as well. But uh, now a little bit of a spin-off question specified to the youth. Uh, Glenn, now you mentioned that with a phone anything is possible uh, when it comes to journalism and that is the essence of mobile journalism. Now I just want to ask you out of curiosity, is it the case that youth are at a categorical advantage when it comes to mobile journalism because uh, we've seen, you know, we've grown up with technology. Some may argue that that is not the case because we've gotten used to basically having the phone with specified apps and we're not really creating, we're consuming. So are we at a disadvantage or an advantage? What do you think? You know, I think one of the really, really interesting things for me over my journey has been the pivot in the style of storytelling based on uh, demographics. Or to put it in simple language, I'm a diehard former TV guy, I spent 20 years in the TV business and have been programmed, for want of a better word, to put a story together in a very specific even formulaic way. This is the classic television news report model. Where I think the youth of today have a real advantage is, is that they are what are known as digital natives. They don't have the legacy or the fear or the baggage that older traditional tele television people have. 
and they already speak the language of social media innately. So I see it actually as a huge, a huge advantage. I, I, I had the opportunity a few years back to speak to um, the managing director of AJ Plus, which is the digital news service for Al Jazeera, and Dima Khatib basically shared with me that their strategy was twofold. One, they wanted to try and have a perfectly 50-50 split in gender balance, so er they wanted half male, half female in their newsroom. And the second one was that they wanted to recruit from pretty much every state, every country in the planet. So there was literally representation across the world. I thought that was a wonderful strategy. And I think the other key thing is the key age profile of their staff is between 23 and 24 because they want to reach 23 and 24 year olds. So I guess to sum it up, I would say this. I'd say I would say most individuals, youth or into their early 20s, they actually have a really distinct advantage because they know the language of communication with their peers. They know how to make content that resonates with their peers. And that looks very different to what traditional television news storytelling looks like. Exactly. There is a different taste, a different style that is being carried out by the youth. And especially across Sri Lanka, we've seen a very recent boom in mobile journalism and content creation in general. Sure. Because a lot of us were just consumers and we basically just, you know, consumed whatever content was put forth from across the world. I guess there was enough inspiration that collected for some people to make a change. And, and that is what we saw at Mojo Lanka as well. And I'm sure that's what we're seeing at Mojo Fest as well. Um, now, a little bit of an extra question before we go into a break when you are considering the youth now is it true that with newsrooms that are existing in the current state mm. is it a little bit more difficult for youth to enter into already hierarchical new newsrooms where they're set in their ways and they have a certain you know for, as you mentioned formulaic means of compiling stories uh, it is believed that the youth have a little bit of a more liberal pattern of thinking you know, a little bit more creativity do you believe that current newsrooms may cause a hindering of that creativity and do you encourage youth to join newsrooms that are already you know, very much popularly based and have been in the business for decades. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Glenn? I've personally spoken to people who are perhaps in their early 20s, pushing into early 30s, who've worked in traditional TV, TV newsrooms and found it incredibly frustrating. Because it's so formulaic, because it's so hierarchical, they find it very hard to do anything outside the established norms. Uh, you could argue that in many ways creativity, the ability to push the boundaries, is quite actively stifled. And I think that is often a major frustration for younger people going into the industry. I think the attraction of the industry is that they know that having an established brand on their CV is potentially going to be advantageous. And to some degree, if they get a, sec a secure full-time job, it's a regular paycheck. There's no risk. You know that you're going to have a, you know, money at the end of every week or every month. So there's pros and cons. But I do think a lot of the new emerging creator economy, which is not necessarily journalism, is framed around this idea of your own brand, developing your own brand as effectively a business proposition. So I've had the chance over the years to speak to quite a lot of people who are influential uh, YouTubers. I had the chance to ask them about what their advice would be to people who are starting out, what are the key things that drive success. And they all said fundamentally two things. The first thing is to be really, really clear about your tribe, to know the people that you're speaking to from the get-go. So do you know what the topic is that you're going to be interested in and who that audience is that you want to speak to? And the second thing is basically consistency and persistence. So in other words, if you say, hi, I'm launching a YouTube channel, I'm going to talk about technology, then you stay on technology as a theme. And if you say, I'm going to publish every Friday, you publish every Friday, come hell or high water. So that idea of consistency and making sure that you deliver on an ongoing basis is really key. Um, and then the persistence thing is important. So you're not going to get a million subscribers in a couple of weeks. You really need to be prepared to go the long haul. Exactly. And as a final question, um, do you believe that youth will be able to hold on to their passions if their passion is mobile journalism? Uh, hold on to their passion as well as hold on to their finances and, hold, and stay afloat, basically. Do you think that is a possibility or is it still too far-fetched? I, I put it like this. I don't want to oversell it. I mean, I, I am a bit of an evangelist, but at the same time, I'm, I'm a pragmatist. So I'll, I'll give you the honest answer. I think a lot of people probably put the cart before the horse, as the expression goes, when it comes to Mojo, which is the first thing they think about is, oh my god, I'm going to have to get loads of gear. 
that's actually a mistake. Straight up, that's absolutely a mistake. So I would say, once they have the phone, maybe the microphone, start developing your skill as a storyteller. Don't waste your money on loads of gear. Once you develop your skill as a storyteller, you should start to build audience. With audience comes profile, with profile comes money. A lot of the influencers that I've met all build this idea is that you need to amass a certain following before you can start to monetize your content, but it is possible to make a living at it. All right, well, I feel like that's a perfect uh, a way to finish off this segment and we'll, we have a lot to talk about, especially when it comes to current events. There is a lot that mobile journalism has done and there's a lot that a lot of people, that a lot of people are claiming that mobile journalism has caused in a disruptive manner. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of controversy to address as well. But before that, let's take a very short commercial break. You're watching Gen XYZ. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're watching Gen XYZ and we were in discussion with Mr. Glenn Mulcahy, the, the director and also the founder of Mojo Fest Limited. We were just talking about Mojo Lanka and we were talking about Mojo in general and how it came to be and all of the aspects regarding the inception and the current status. Now, we have gotten a lot of the foundation down. But I'm sure that a lot of us watching would have this main question. Now, we know that Mojo exists, but we have it separated subconsciously in our mind. We never think that Mojo reaches the newsrooms. But as a matter of fact, Mojo is starting to become a very uh, integral part of newsrooms and breaking news today. So I'm sure that a lot of us would like, uh, very much like your input on this entire issue, Glenn. Could you just let us know how mobile journalism has essentially impacted breaking news and also the newsroom in general? Yeah, so um, mobile journalism, I guess, has two impacts. Some of the newsrooms that I've worked with have a very kind of what I would call long-term strategy with mobile, where it becomes another part of the news gathering resources. So they have traditional camera crews, they may have video journalists with those bigger cameras I referred to before, and then they have a team of mobile journalists as well. And the way they divide those resources are usually based on the nature of the stories. There are things that mobile phones are not particularly good at, for instance, Zoom. So you would not send someone with a mobile phone to cover a soccer game because you can't zoom in on the players, as an example. So um, that's the mixed economy model, where it is an integral part of the news gathering service. Then there is the flip side of that, which is where the journalists aren't every day creating content with mobile phones, but they are all trained to use the phones should a breaking news story happen. A lot of those news organizations actually rely on mobile phones to do live streaming rather than to do finished packages. Um, I'll give examples. So, for instance, Sky News, as far back as 2014, skilled up all of their foreign correspondents with the intention of basically allowing them to go live on air in 90 seconds just using their smartphones. And they achieved a lot of very, very big breaking stories using that technique. So I think it's a two-part strategy. More polished, longer form packages as part of the general news gathering strategy where you tend to get dedicated mobile journalists in the team and then a more general strategy which is to train everyone up to be able to go live or do short clips and send them back unedited uh, in breaking news situations. So there is a dichotomy almost of how news co newsrooms and news corporations can approach mobile journalism. Either way, do you believe that all mobile journalism is inclusive in almost all newsrooms across the globe or is there... Not, no. <laughs> by a long, not by a long chalk. Um, I was in uh, Las Vegas about three weeks ago, and I was at this big international broadcast event, and I was there to speak about mobile journalism, of course. And I would say of lecturers that came to talk to me from all the different major universities in the US who are teaching journalism, 10% had mobile journalism on their curriculum. So if that's a litmus test of how popular it is within the academic system, remember they're the people who train the next generation of journalists going into the news system in the US. I think it's fair to say it's nowhere near reached its full potential. Now I will also say, because you know, you referenced how it has become much, much more popularized in Sri Lanka in the last number of years. Certainly I would say that I've seen a push, certainly as a result of the pandemic, 
where people were forced to turn to their phones as a way of getting content out. And that is kind of, it's broken a lot of the, the preconceived bias about the limitations of the device. So certainly the last two or three years, partly driven out of necessity, I think we've seen a surge in mobile journalism and more organizations as a result genuinely having their mind open to the potential. Exactly. Um, and now you just mentioned that the litmus test you mentioned, the 10% that have included mobile journalism in yeah. their curriculum, does that mean that there is no structural way of creating mobile journalists or being learned mobile journalists with an actual educational background? Okay, so I'll, I'll give you a take on it, which is to the best of my knowledge at this moment in time, there is no certified academic course which will basically give you a master's or a degree in mobile journalism. However, there are quite a number. I mean, I've personally been involved with the uh, CNN Academy, which will give you a master's in, in digital journalism, not strictly mobile journalism, and that's a one-year program in Dublin in Ireland. So there are courses where it is a module, but you never qualify as a mobile journalist. A digital journalist, yes, but no one, to the best of my knowledge, is actually giving you mobile journalism as a certification. And yet I find it ironic that even when mobile journalism is not a specific certificate, while it is not academically acknowledged as much across the globe uh, still yet, yeah. um, we still see that there's this huge wave of mobile journalism that happened especially post pandemic or during the pandemic uh, and it's almost driving news corporations to the brink where there is an issue of content production that is more popular on uh, so social media sites because that is exactly the versatile way that people like to receive their information. So what are your thoughts on the idea that newsrooms are becoming almost obsolete due to mobile journalism? Is that just mass hysteria? Is there truth behind it? I'm not too sure newsrooms themselves are becoming obsolete. I think there are trends that you can, you know, you can factually observe these trends. So I mentioned in my keynote speech the most recent Reuters report on digital news, which they've published every year since 2012. And again, for the 10th or 12th year in a row, they have referred to the idea of the decline in linear viewership of television news. So the audience slowly, and it's only a small percentage per year, maybe three to 5%, but it's still over a decade, that's a lot of people uh, switching off. And it's not necessarily that they are actively switching off from news in general, it's just that their behaviors are changing and they're no longer watching television news. They basically, as you've said, they turn to social media or websites to get their content. And I mean, I'm one of them, paradoxically. I'm 50 years old, and part of the reason I don't really watch television news anymore is it would have been a six o'clock news bulletin that I grew up with. By six o'clock every day, I know more about every news story that I'm gonna follow than I will see in a one-hour TV show. So I think newsrooms are faced with this quandary of do we adapt what we do so that we basically stop doing television production and pivot towards mobile? But no newsroom that I'm aware of has actively done that because the business case is not there to support it yet. Once you're on television, even if the numbers are slowly in decline, you can still, if you're a commercial entity, attract big advertising revenue to fund the entire business model. Social is still a bit of a, a dark art when it comes to trying to find a sustainable way to pay for the journalism. So I don't see any newsroom panicking just yet, but the, pragmat the pragmatists in newsrooms know that no newsroom who actually genuinely wants to reach an audience will only do one or the other. Doing both makes most sense. And the other thing to remember is, on television, your average age is probably 47 to 70. In social media, it's everyone else. So if you want to reach both audiences, you need to be in both places. But most importantly, you need to tell stories that resonate with those audiences. And that means telling stories in different ways. Exactly. So there is a hint of versatility. If adapted by newsrooms, there is no panic of it being archaic media uh, and there is a way for newsrooms to grow as well and I'm sure that the youth watching right now would like to uh, ask you this question are you sure Glenn because a lot of us I mean a lot of our demographic uh, really they watch uh, online on YouTube even this program you might be watching it on YouTube as we speak so there is always that issue when it comes to serious pieces of media uh, now 
we understand that the TV is usually reserved to be turned on in some households where there is like mass panic going on. Like the pandemic start had sure. so much TV viewership, That's you know, with live updates with BBC, Sky News and other main news producers across the world. Um, but over the years, we see that there is a lot of moral panics that have happened and less and less people have turned on their TV to check specifically on that panic. So I'd like to ask you on that note, conflicts that are happening across the world, there's so much coverage across the platforms that are available to us. But how crucial of a role does mobile journalism play in this entire fiasco of maybe uh, currently we know that there is a conflict in Russia, Ukraine, Syria, uh, even the migrant issue that's happening right now. How crucially does mobile journalism impact these? So I refer to the idea of the, de the democratization of media. And again, that term has really been abandoned around for 20 plus years, but I think mobile has brought it to a brand new level. I talked about this idea of professional journalism versus user generated content. There's two distinct kind of movements, if you like, within the mobile movement overall. Um, I think for those sort of emerging stories, it's not strictly journalism, but it is reporting. And I, I differentiate between professional journalism as a career and citizen reporting as what you get as UGC. But I think that has played a massive role in these conflicts. Because if you look, I mean, when Russia invaded Ukraine, probably within just a matter of weeks, we saw the headlines like, is this the first social media war? because we were seeing these massive swarm of, of bots basically posting either pro or anti-Russian uh, material, same for Ukraine, and it was all orchestrated. It was genuinely propaganda. So what it brought into very, very fine focus was, with the power for everyone to have a voice, there is the power for multi-platform propaganda to proliferate as well. We've seen very alarming statistics like the truth versus fake news. Fake news will amplify 10 times more and 10 times faster than fact. This leaves news organizations in real quandary. If people are not listening to the truth, then we really have a problem to face into. And I think this is what brings the idea of verification and trust into fine tune, fine focus for every news organization. I said at the keynote that ultimately, we have argued about quality and technical stuff about mobile for a decade, but the time has come to forget about that argument. It is over. Now the only argument that remains is the relationship, the contract that we have with our audience, and that needs to be founded in integrity, trust, and transparency. If we don't have that, as we approach the age of AI and the tsunami of content that's coming with it, we have nothing left to hold on to. So it is absolutely pivotal that every news organization is got a system or a team in place to be able to verify user-generated content and basically stand over it and be accountable if they get it wrong. That's super important. And then at the same time, it's very important for news organizations to build on their teams. So you know, you can put 15 mobile journalists in the field for the cost of one camera crew. I'm not saying get rid of the camera crews, they still have value, but maybe buy one less camera and put 20 people out in the field. There's a business model that we need to start to properly exploit now. Exactly, and there is room for growth as well when it comes to the whole misinformation issue. There's always conversation and there's always scandal and controversy that's being stirred up. I, I'm not exactly sure by which parties they're being peddled by, but there's always that talk, you know, someone shot this on their phone, it's not like you can verify if this is fact or fiction. We don't know if it was manipulated footage. There's uh, the journalistic integrity is a huge issue that a lot of people uh, come into conflict with when it comes to mobile journalism and right now probably uh, regular journalism as well in recent times with the conflicts that are sure. occurring. But what do you have to say specifically to the youth, uh, Glenn, when it comes to the whole journalistic integrity front and manipulation and fear mongering? Basically, clickbait or content creation, you know, for interaction, uh, you might exaggerate or miniscalize certain stories and that is practically a manipulation of facts, well, like you just previously mentioned, where we have to hold ourselves to ideals. What is your message to the youth, Glenn, when it comes to this issue? I think there's a, there's a really interesting kind of pivot, I think, within general communities, not just the youth, and that is that for years, people were used to being served news by news organizations and just simply believed it. It was blind faith. That, when you put it into the context of what happened in America, where you basically left-leaning, right-leaning news organizations who basically absolutely tell op opposing opinions on every single story, leaves you in a quagmire. 
And what we've seen with the, with the rise of social media is the rise of what are known as echo chambers, where people will turn off news they don't like or don't want to hear to actively only hear the news that they believe. Whether it's right or wrong seems to be irrelevant. So there's one thing that every professional journalist has taught, whether they go through academia or whether they're just, you know, work their way up in an organization, and that is the ability to be skeptical of everything that you hear. Every journalist knows intimately that for every story they do, they need to bring a healthy dose of skepticism so that they can question its integrity and the veracity of the details. The thing about it is the public don't do that. The public, if they see something shared from a friend, they'll just engage, potentially reshare, and hence amplify the messaging. And if I could say anything, I think the ultimate thing is that we all, irrespective of whether we're professional journalists or otherwise, as citizens of this planet, we all have a responsibility to at least get into the habit of fact-checking the news that we consume. Because I've mentioned it, I spoke at length at the conference about this idea of the rise of AI. AI has huge potential to transform what we do and to streamline workflows and take the drudge out of some of the work processes. But if it can work for good news organizations, it can work for propaganda engines as well. And that means that this tsunami of AI kind of content that we see, which is, it started already, but I think we will see the pinnacle by the time the next US election comes, that's when it will be so important for people to be willing to fact check, to do their own homework, and then to look to organizations of trust above all else for their news. The echo chamber phenomenon that we've seen is actually incredibly dangerous, and it's something that we all need to take a bit of personal ownership on. Of course, that is quite the insightful and impactful message, I feel, because we have all experienced it in some way or another, where we have blindly believed some piece of information, and somehow it turns out that it wasn't verified, it was completely just fear-mongering or clickbait, Absolutely. and we've all felt somewhat inferior in that sense, where we thought, why did I just believe that outright? So I'm sure that a lot of us, especially when it comes to the AI front, would like to learn a little bit more. So the next segment will be on AI and the future of mobile journalism. But before that, let's take a very short commercial break. You're watching Gen XYZ. Stay with us. Welcome back to Gen XYZ, we're in conversation with Glenn Mulcahy and he is the founder of MojoFest Limited and the director of MojoFest Limited as well. Uh, you have been having quite the influence in the Mojo world and we'll be talking about how how very influential Mojo has become over the past few years and what big of an impact that Mojo has had in current events, the newsroom, breaking news and also our consumption of media in general uh, and how Mojo has been revolutionized over the past few years. Now, we just before we got into the break in the last previous segment, we were talking about how AI has affected Mojo and basically AI has affected life in general. So I think it's very important to ask now, before the AI aspect, are there regulations in place for mobile journalism specifically? Nothing that I'm aware of. I mean, there's a, if you're a professional journalist, there's a very clear framework about ethics and integrity that you can refer back to. I'm not entirely convinced that adding whatever camera you shoot with into that is actually going to change any of those guidelines. Um, the only thing that was asked at the conference was in relation to privacy and whether you're allowed to shoot in different environments and things. And again, there's a very clearly established rule book, I think in most countries, in relation to privacy and uh, you know, right, right to privacy and stuff. So no, nothing specific to mobile I'm aware of. So there is, would you say there is no specific need or is there a little bit of a requirement for basic uh, regulations? I think a great question that was asked yesterday in relation to the events in Sri Lanka was to do with press freedom and the idea that uh, journalists were basically being intentionally targeted and journalists were being asked to put their phones down and to not document the activity that they saw. And I mean, technically all of those things should actually be covered by press freedoms and by a press card, but that obviously depends on exactly how the country in question basically regards the media. Um, I don't know that there's anything in addition explicitly required for mobile journalism, but there is one thing, because it is someone working on their own, that does come up periodically. In fact, a clip comes to mind in America, probably two years ago, where there was a reporter out in the street doing a piece to camera live on TV, and a car knocked her down when she was live on television. And it, it provoked a huge discussion. She wasn't hurt, by the way. I mean, it was, you know, the car stopped, obviously, so she wasn't badly injured at all. 
but it provoked a huge discussion about the problem with working on your own in a risky environment is that you are focusing on the camera, lots of things can happen from behind and there's literally no one watching your back. So in a lot of the organizations I've worked in, what they look at is they have a kind of a rating system for risk and if it's above a three on a scale of one to five, they will insist on more than one person going. In fact, Al Jazeera, one of the clients I've worked with a lot over the last decade, they use what they call mojo swarms at big events. So in other words, you might put 10 people out in a group, all filming with their devices, but they'll work in teams of two. So if there's anything risky going on, there's one person watching your back literally. So I don't know that you need a, a regulatory framework around it, but common sense is very useful. Of course, common sense is always useful. And the tag team effort sounds like a very viable way to ensure safety and also a little bit of structure in the very chaotic world of media in itself. So now I think the million dollar question uh, that we have, that we just touched on right before the break is AI. So. Glenn, could you just tell us with your experience, how has AI affected mobile journalism specifically? And what, what can we see in the future when it comes to AI? Okay, so it's probably worth knowing to put some context on it. So AI has probably been around for deca decades as a concept, but it's really only in the last 18 months that it has really captured the kind of common interest, okay? Because ChatGPT's launch, particularly about a year ago, really brought it into the mainstream. We saw a million people sign up for ChatGPT in just five days. It's no other platform ever in history has actually managed to do that take up. So there's a huge, I think, public interest in the idea of what it can do. There's a lot of common public narrative about all the risks with it. You know, people losing their jobs, it's going to automate this, you're going to be out of work soon, you won't be able to make a living. What I have seen are two distinct trends. On one side, there are a lot of developers who are creating applications and workflows which will make mobile journalism or general content creation much more streamlined. That can be a simple pipeline like turning widescreen media into something vertical for a different platform. It can be more advanced stuff like taking a voice and adding a transcription or subtitles automatically using AI and voice recognition. And then there's other stuff like uh, technical stuff, like being able to process sound. So maybe in a year or two, we won't need microphones anymore because it can resample the audio. And potentially, we've seen image generators, which may very soon, and technically they already can, it's just not great yet, can generate videos in the same way that currently they're generating still images. So they will literally fabricate, for want of a better word, an entire video channel. Now, with that, whatever that may bring to ease our workload, it also brings massive risk. We touched on this before, the idea that bad actors can also utilize this to mass generate media. So there's a really interesting initiative, and you've touched on this before with the issue of verification. There's an interesting initiative called the Adobe Content Authenticity Initiative, and their entire concept is trying to instill trust in the actual media itself from the moment you create it. And I certainly would like to see personally that in the next 12 months, all the big mobile manufacturers would implement this CAI verification system on their media, which will show you if the media has been manipulated, if it's been modified in any way during its entire lifetime, because it means rather than having to do manual verification to try and cross-reference metadata, you get a flag. It's going to be red or green. If it's red, it immediately says, you need to double check this, try and identify the source. It would take so much of the current laborious tasks that are involved in trying to cross-reference user-generated content out of the equation, and at the same time, I think it would reinforce the audience's trust with us, which, as I said before, really is everything right now. It is the cornerstone of journalism, 100%. journalistic integrity as well. Now, we have unfortunately run out of time, but before we uh, do end the segment, I'm sure a lot of us would like to know, a lot of us watching, uh, the youth that are inspired by mobile journalism and inspired to take a phone into your hand and start doing these content creations and verifying and, you know, with their earnest efforts, they might be a little bit discouraged when it comes to the absolute information overload that mm. we are constantly bombarded with uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So before we end the discussion, if you could speak to our viewers on exactly would it matter if I picked up a camera or if I picked up a phone and started becoming part of the Mojo force? Mm -hmm. Is there even any change that I can do as an individual? So can you make an impact? I, I would say honestly and sincerely, I think that there's a huge opportunity for what I would call niche storytelling. And I would refer this back to the traditional television structures and the resources and how that entire industry works. So having worked in news for 13 years, 
Every single day that they discussed the topics and the news stories of the day, we looked at the amount of journalists we had, often 80, 100 journalists, and the amount of resources we had. Two satellite trucks, maybe 10 camera crews. No matter how efficient the camera crews are, there are at least 80 potential stories that are never going to see the light of day because there aren't enough people to make them. There isn't enough resources to go around. Mobile completely obliterates that argument. And with it comes the opportunity to tell stories that would never normally feel or never normally feature in the mainstream narrative. So if you look to niche topics, something that you're personally passionate about, if you look at something where there are underrepresented communities or groups, those are the stories where there is an obvious gap in the market, and that's where you can make an impact. So find your passion, develop your skill set, and basically really focus on a specific niche. And that, for me at least, is the best way forward to have impact. All right, well, now a question of curiosity. Um, I'm sure a lot of us now, we did touch on this multiple times uh, in the previous segments, but just to clarify to our audience, the specific demographic, we consider content creation as an umbrella. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that you're well aware, of course, Glenn, with your background in media and journalism, uh, that content creation is not just one big lump. It is categorized into special areas, as you previously mentioned as well. Could you please explain to us how mobile journalism will differ in the future when it comes to the aspects of content creation? How drastically will these uh, two forms be you know, separated or will it be cohesive? How do you think the trend looks like for the future? I think probably the first thing to say is that content creation as an umbrella term, while it encapsulates, encapsulates I guess, documentary and journalism, but it's also vlogging and entertainment, and it's a, it's a huge umbrella term for basically creators, okay? So I've always kind of held the belief that they are two quite dis different disciplines in the sense that journalism has a very predefined set of kind of rules about what it needs to be to be defined as journalism. Vlogging, while it can be topical and potentially newsworthy, doesn't have to be strictly journalism. And then there is the whole world of user-generated reporting as well, which is again a slightly different thing because that doesn't necessarily work within the traditional journalistic framework. So I'm not too sure that they're going to diverge any further than they already have, but I definitely think we're going to consider to see crossover. Someone asked me a question about this actually at the conference, which I thought was very interesting. They said, like, is it possible to make a business case that has both journalism and entertainment in one? And to me, as a diehard old television person, I kind of got a, a bit of a shiver down my spine and went, I think the most important thing is that you're explicitly clear about which is which. Don't mix up entertainment with news, entertainment with news, because I personally feel that that might undervalue the integrity of the journalism a little bit. We see this sometimes with brands pandering to clickbait to try and drive viewership numbers and KPIs rather than necessarily really focus on hardcore news. And I, I get it that there's a struggle to make the numbers work, to make the business model work. But I think you just need to be really, really careful about journalism strictly. Everyone can have an opinion. And I'm not saying there's no room for opinion. In fact, mobile really offers a huge opportunity for everyone to have a voice. I've been saying this for a decade, giving a voice to the voiceless. But journalism is a discipline. It's an academic discipline, it's a professional discipline, and for me at least, there are a set of rules that clearly define what that is. So I think we've already probably seen how they can run in parallel and occasionally perhaps cross-pollinate, but I think ultimately they are two separate things. They are two separate things, and I'm sure that the current uh, viewership right now might beg to differ with exactly how inclusive that content creation is mm. to uh, journalism, basically, where we've seen, I mean, I would not uh, name drop, of course, but there are certain very popular social media sites, uh, social media pages uh, that have turned to news, that have turned to updates along with their entertainment content and what you just mentioned uh, might have happened and of course there is a break that is necessary uh, but unfortunately while there is a lot more to speak about on this topic uh, we have come against time uh, and I'm sure that our viewers have taken home quite a lot of information and are probably inspired you know maybe they would also pick up a phone or pick up uh, you know their laptop uh, open up premiere or whichever uh, editing software that is available and start learning start uh, you know documenting around them and like you said giving a voice to the voiceless where there are gaps in information yeah. uh, that is the goal and i hope i believe that is what mojo is also trying to uh, basically prolifer prolifer proliferate uh, 
on a global scale and especially in Sri Lanka. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Glenn Mokahi, the director of MojoFest Limited, for taking the time to speak to our viewers today. My pleasure. And that is all the time we have for you tonight on Gen XYZ. Join us again next week as we bring you yet another topic related to the youth. Now, if in case you missed any of today's programs, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. I'm Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. This is Gen XYZ. Have a good night. <laughs>